In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can, jo you can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live, which is also listed in your program. You can also follow us on Instagram at the JFK Junior Forum. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming tonight's guests, Commissioner Vestager and Professor Jason Furman. Hello. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you all for joining us. This is the 24th year of the Albert H. Gordon Lecture, something that focuses on finance, public policy, and especially um, internationalization. Um, I read his obituary in preparation for this, and it was written in 2009 and talked about the really critical role he played in saving his financial firm from the Great Depression in 1929, um, because he died at 107. And I think he would be thrilled that we have as our guest, Marguerite Vestire, the commissioner of DGCOM, probably the single most visible commissioner um, in the European Commission for the huge role that she's played as one of the leading, um, anti the leading antitrust enforcer um, in the world, former deputy prime minister of Denmark. And I was hoping the first thing you could do for us is just explain what DGCOMP is, what it does, and why someone who doesn't have a technical antitrust background um, should be trusted to be in charge of it. <laughs> well, first of all, on, on your last point, because then, then you're never tempted to try to be a bit better lawyer than your lawyers, uh, because that would be a trap. Um, you get someone because uh, every organization, of course, needs leadership. You need someone to set the direction, to take the responsibility, uh, to make sort of the checks and balances work so you get the quality uh, that you would want to. Um, because what you do is, uh, and it, this has been going on for 60 years, so it's quite impressive. Uh, because when things have been going on for 60 years, I'm still in my fifth year a newcomer to this. Um, they, we enforce, on behalf of 500 million people, uh, competition law with the purpose of uh, making sure that the market serves consumers. Just as well as society is for citizens, markets should serve consumers. Uh, tech should serve humans, but we can come back to that. Um, and when, when it all got started, the inspiration c came from here, uh, with the Sherman Act. Uh, our founders, they, they were looking at a Europe that was completely destroyed after the Second World War physically, but of course also spiritually, nothing. Uh, and they realized that in order to keep peace in such a bloody continent, they had to find a number of different things uh, to put in place. One of those were competition law enforcement. And they made this very strong choice to say, well, in Europe, we want to have fair competition. How to make that happen? And then they looked to the US, so they took the inspiration to do uh, the antitrust work, uh, to find uh, secret cartels, misuse of dominant position, uh, but also merger control. So that you cannot, as a company, when you're successful, misuse your power against others. Uh, you cannot form secret cartels so that we decide in secrecy, I take the left side, you take the right side. But there was one last thing that they put on top of that, and that was a tool called uh, state aid control. Because uh, they realized that not only can businesses do things towards other businesses that would be harmful to competition, if a member state signs up with some businesses against other businesses, this will be very harmful for competition as well. Uh, so we have this prohibition of handing out taxpayers' money to uh, some companies not available to other companies. Um, and very early case law would say that such a handout could come in any form. Um, a building, cash, uh, a tax benefit. And this is the background of the tax cases that we're doing right now. So we have these tools, we enforce them, always with the aim of enabling 
uh, the consumer, to make sure that the market serves the consumer. Um, I'd love to come back to state aid and taxation if we have time. I um, wanted to start with a few general things and then get to the digital sector. You know, at the Kennedy School, we're all about ideas and the mm -hmm. impact of ideas on public policy. One of the big either successes or disasters, depending on your perspective, um, has been the Chicago School of Antitrust, a set of ideas that emanated from universities that was taught to lawyers and judges and economists and has had a big impact in reducing antitrust enforcement and mergers, at least in the United States. Um, do you think you've seen that same trend in Europe? Um, how would you compare you know, your level of activity to what you see in the United States, the importance of you know, those types of ideas? Well, since we're quite busy uh, in sort of the day job in enforcing competition law uh, just in the European market, we don't spend much time sort of grading uh, colleagues uh, all over the world. But I'd say... I can't get you to? No. Okay. Uh, but I say that we are kept quite busy also by U.S. companies complaining about other U.S. companies doing business in Europe. Uh, that would be the background of the Google cases. We have a lot of U.S. Uh, complainants because Europe is a great place to do business. Um, so that is keeping us busy uh, just from the Europe in the European marketplace. And um, I'd say that there is no room for complacency. Uh, we don't have exactly the same trends as here, but we also see increased concentration. Uh, we also see that profitability is going up. It took so quite some time because we were stuck for a longer time in the financial crisis, but it has been picking up quite a lot. So we see increased concentration, increased profitability, and increased inequality. And of course, we don't know if there's a direct link with uh, competitive marketplaces, but I think it's, it's a good thing to assume that fair competition would be one of the things that you would expect in a marketplace that's not too concentrated, where profitability is uh, distributed m among different sectors uh, and where inequality is, uh, is manageable. So let's get to the digital sector now. And I mm -hmm. want to talk about what you've done. Um, but before that, I want to talk about something you haven't done, which is there have been, I think, 400 acquisitions by the mm -hmm. major digital platforms and none of them have been challenged in any substantial way. In fact, most of them haven't been scrutinized mm -hmm. by any competition authority in the world, including yours. Um, do you think in retrospect, you know, any of those merger approvals were a mistake, should have been looked at harder? Well, we looked at a few of them. Uh, the acquisition of uh, Shazam by Apple, uh, WhatsApp by Facebook, uh, LinkedIn by Microsoft. And we could only do that because of refel. Uh, that's jurisdictions where there could have been uh, a scrutiny that they asked us to do it. So when we did it, we were, of course, very well aware that this was not sort of day-to-day uh, -day business um, because it's, these were smaller companies acquired by giants. So they wouldn't meet any of our thresholds. Uh, what we found uh, was very few, if any, reasons to be concerned when it comes to competition. It has made us think, though, because as you say, hundreds of companies have been acquired by the giants, that maybe we should consider how to be able to look further into this. Um, it's, it's a discussion where we try to balance things out, because on the one hand side, we have the suspicion of killer acquisitions, that you buy innovation, in order to kill it, because it's something that will threaten your business, which is a good business, it should be stable, you don't want to be challenged. That could be one theory of harm. But it could also be that you actually step in the, in the place of a non -ver not very well working capital market. Uh, because some of these businesses, they don't get scale because uh, the capital market in Europe is not as dynamic as here in the US. So you get someone to step in and actually grow these ideas. And thirdly, if you have started a business and your business idea is to start it and then sell it, well, you should have pretty good reasons to question uh, that this can happen. 
So we're in the middle of, discuss uh, of discussing, should we get a tool to allow us to see some of these acquisitions, uh, in particular, if they're damaging to innovation? Do you think if Facebook tried to do something like the Instagram acquisition today, it would get a level of scrutiny it didn't get at the time? Yes, this is likely because both businesses has grown. Uh, Instagram has grown uh, quite a lot. At least I'm told by my daughters that if you're new on Facebook, you're officially old. Um, so, of course, uh, new social services, uh, they will grow. Uh, but also because now you will have a different concern about uh, the matching of data sets, the amounts of data that can be collected, uh, and how that will work as a, uh, as a risk of foreclosure into the market of social uh, media. And some people, including your own chief economist, have floated the idea that it's so hard to figure out if these mergers are okay or not okay, that antitrust enforcers need rules of thumb, and that the rule of thumb should be shifted to, you know what, if it's a large digital platform, they're going to have to prove to us it's a benefit to consumers, as opposed to the opposite. The antitrust enforcers are always the ones that have to prove um, that it's a problem. Would you think reversing the burden of proof to make it in these cases where it's murky, hard to prove, hard to be sure of anything, you know, putting the burden on them instead of you would make sense? Well, I think it depends on, on the context. Uh, because imagine if we uh, get more advanced in our understanding of how data market works, how data can be shared, how data can be made uh, available in different uh, ways. Uh, if you have a, cha a, a change in the context, you may say, well, then you wouldn't have the same worry about some of those acquisitions, because then data would be available uh, in a different manner. Uh, and as I said, there are a number of, of different things to be taken into consideration when a, a small business is being sold. Uh, so I think it is quite far-reaching to sell, well, as a rule of thumb, you cannot sell your business. That's very, very far-reaching. Uh, so I would rather sort of progress into saying, well, uh, we had take an issue with data, because that is what will foreclose others into entering into this market. So now, talking about what you have done, um, billions of dollars in fines on Google for shopping, for the way they've designed their Android operating system. You know, how would you explain to people that there's even a problem there when this was free, consumers had a choice about whether to use Google as their search engine, they could go to Amazon, you know, what's, what could possibly be wrong in this sector that would require any enforcement by you? Well, I think most people, they, they enjoy new services. They enjoy that someone gets a great idea and they transform this great idea into a new service. And what we saw in the, in the Android case was that the uh, the different actions uh, by Google uh, that we find to be illegal uh, in accordance with, uh, with European competition law, well, they basically put a lid on innovation because they made it impossible to use uh, abilities and skills uh, to make what we call an Android fork, a new version of Android, because it's, it's amazing software. It's such a good idea that it's open source. That is great, obviously because then anyone with the skill, which is not me, uh, can then make a new version. But the problem was that when you say then to people who uh, manufacture phones, if you produce one phone with a new version of Android, you cannot use Android on any of your phones, not any of your phones in your product portfolio. Well, then you get quite, quite reluctant to deal with the clever guy with a new version. Uh, so we see there's a lit put to, uh, to innovation. Uh, and with the other, both uh, the exclusivity payments, uh, with the tying, if you, of, of course you want a Play Store. You want an App Store, you want to enable uh, the one who buys your phone uh, to get more apps on the phone. That's part of the attraction. And well, Google then says, well, of course you can have the Play Store, but if you have the Play Store, you take the search app and the browser as well then you have the same effect because it stops choice. And we know that because we, of course, 
test and test and test and test, and we find that most of us, out of the box, if it works, you don't go looking for something else. Yeah, I mean, one of the striking things is Google says competition is just a click away, but they also pay companies like Apple a huge amount of money to be the default search engine. Yes. So they understand. Um, and this is why if it was, if it was the, th the truth that it's just a click away and these are superior products, then none of this illegal behavior would be necessary. Right. Now, is there a better approach, though, than these cases? One, the shopping one, I think, took eight years of my... Mm -hmm. Took eight years. It's hard for the companies to understand how it applies in a domain outside of the specific one in that case. The... You know, remedies may come too late when a lot of the competitors have been extinguished because everything moves so quickly. Um, is antitrust the right tool? Is, are there other tools we should be thinking about? Well, it's, it's one of the tools, obviously, but, you know, I'm quite happy with my hammer. But uh, I, of course, realize that not everything then becomes a nail. Uh, and you really need to think about how can regulation and antitrust law enforcement uh, supplement one another. And if you look at now, we're at the end of, uh, of the five-year mandate of the commission that I'm part of. If you see sort of what has been going on, you see the, the entry trust work, the three Google cases, uh, the Amazon case, um, what we are uh, doing now, uh, still looking into how data is being used in a number of instances. Just two days ago, the European Parliament voted in favor of our new copyright uh, legislation. We have legislation about the relationship between platform and businesses to allow for transparency. We have digital citizen rights, so you know that you own your data. You can uh, change your data from one provider to another. You have the right to be forgotten. Uh, you have new consumer uh, protection when you shop uh, online. Uh, we have regulation now about uh, data portability, also large scale. This is just to give you a couple of the examples of what is happening when sort of democracy uh, catches up with an industrial revolution. Because not only for antitrust, also for the legislator, uh, speed is a challenge here. Because usually we would need quite a lot of time to understand what happens in an industrial revolution took quite some time when we got in control of working conditions after the first industrial revolution. took quite some time before we get to ban ch children uh, working, before we got decent working hours, because we ban beco before we banned harmful substances uh, in the workplace. took quite some time. Here, we don't have that kind of time to sort of get in control of what is happening in an industrial revolution like the digital uh, one we're in right now. And this is why you see both the antitrust uh, work and the regulation moving forward with quite some speed. Of course, one thing is passing legislation by the legislator. It's another matter actually to implement it and get people to feel confident. Because, for instance, if you take our digital citizen rights, it's great to have rights. It's even better to be able to exercise them. Yeah, I told um, Commissioner Vestager that most of what I wanted to accomplish here was to enable her to talk about whatever she wanted to talk about. Um, but I did have another motive in doing this whole interview. So I'm going to take a brief interlude for that motive, if you would forgive me. Um, I chaired a panel for the UK mm -hmm. government, which came up with a set of recommendations um, similar to what you've been talking about on both refreshing the way you approach mergers and antitrust, mm -hmm. but also setting out some ex ante um, codes of conduct, rules, all of which were designed to enable more competition, facilitate more entry. What did you think of this set of ideas? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is, it is a little awkward now. Can you feel it? <laughs> <laughs> sort of in the room? No, but the thing is that it is, it is a, it's great work. Uh, and it is indeed what we need, because what you're doing uh, with uh, the UK report, I have three special advisors. They will also table a report uh, in just one, two weeks uh, from now. We have the Australian uh, report as well. Uh, the French are thinking about it too. So you have a lot of uh, thoughtful, thoughtful, insightful uh, recommendation being tabled that will allow us I think to take uh, action in the coming uh, 
month um, to scope uh, the tools that we need to bring competition law enforcement also up to speed. A lot of the tools we have already extremely useful. Uh, the legislation we used to do uh, the uh, Android case, this is also the kind of thinking that we had used in a case concerning nails and nail guns, you know, kind of old school products where someone was tying the two products together. If you buy this nail gun, you have to buy these type of nails. Oh, this isn't the metaphor anymore. No, it's not a metaphor. <laughs> it's for real. <laughs> Same kind of legislation used in very advanced markets uh, in the Android case. So, of course, we can push a lot of our tools and use them also on new substances because the basic logic is the same. But we need to push it as well. And there, I think, your rec recommendations, uh, hopefully the recommendations of my special advisors, what we have from the Australians will sort of uh, enable us to know the landscape that we're in. Great. So, uh, the end of the self-interested portion of my moderation. Um, and back to the questions. Uh, could you decide to break up the big tech companies? Is that something Europe could do if it wanted to? Or are there American companies and you don't even have the power to? Well, it would be, for us, it would be sort of very last resort uh, measure. And I'd say with the debate here, uh, with the proposals um, suggested or things suggested by, uh, by Elizabeth Warren, we feel sort of kind of mainstream in Europe. Um, because the work we do with using our antitrust tools, well, they have the purpose of uh, making sure that these companies also serve their customers, that innovation is thriving. Um, and we, of course, want to, to achieve that. But we have the same discussion in Europe as well. It is the thing in the European Parliament. Should these businesses be broken up? Are you actively studying that? No, we're not. Uh, we're actively uh, sort of making sure that what we have done so far is, is working. Uh, you probably saw, uh, I just gave a update on how the remedies are working in the two uh, Google cases that we have decided, the shopping case and, uh, and the Android case. In the shopping case now, in the shopping box, the, the thing about the Google case was that the shopping bus box was exclusively for uh, the Google uh, shopping comparison service. Uh, and any competitor uh, was demoted on average to page four in your search results. Anyone been there? No? This is where I keep my secrets. You can put yours there as well because no one ever comes. Um, so no one Instead was... Instead of the right to be forgotten, you should just have the right yes. to be on page four of the search Exactly, box. exactly. <laughs> Uh, but no one could go to the shopping box. Uh, now, with the remedies that Google put in place after the decision, uh, in, I think, 75% uh, of shopping boxes, at least one rival would be present. And in quite a number of them, you would see two rivals. Uh, that could be Kelku, that could be others uh, that would do shopping comparison for you. Uh, they're in the process of implementing what they call a toggle that you can either have product results in the shopping box or you can see different uh, shopping comparison services in the shopping box if you want to compare further. And in 40% of, uh, of instances, a click in the shopping box would go to a competitor of Google. So it has quite changed uh, that landscape. Uh, in the Android case, uh, Google has announced uh, that they will put in uh, a choice screen uh, if Google is, uh, is the, def the, f the default, uh, then they will put in a choice screen so that people who buy an Android phone, or indeed all the people who have uh, an Android phone, they will be able to choose. Uh, and that, of course, is a very important point because you see in both instances, this is about choice, that, and that choice is for real, not in sort of a manipulated uh, way, the fiction of just one click away, but for real that you see what you would think of as important in the same place. So you have a real choice. And you know, these are all American companies. Why do you think we don't have European companies of this sort? I mean, maybe Spotify. Yes, yeah, Spotify would be one. Uh, SAP would be another, uh, which is a very sort of business to business. Uh, so we wouldn't use it, we wouldn't stumble upon it uh, as, uh, as uh, citizen or, or private consumers. I think there are, there are two main reasons. One would be that we haven't had 
a digital single market until now. Uh, this you have here. To a completely different degree, you would have also a digital single market. You wouldn't have language barriers. You would be able to expand in a completely different way than in Europe, where you have a number of language barriers. To a very large degree, you still have national markets. So you can grow your business here and then come to Europe. If you start growing your business in Europe, you will be faced immediately, as it were, with language barriers, national uh, regulation, uh, so you'd have to overcome much more. Now, at long last, we have a digital single market. Second thing is that the European capital market is not as dynamic as the US. We put a lot of effort into this. I think one of the reasons why the US economy recovered uh, much quicker from the financial crisis was the fact that US businesses are not at all as dependent on banks. The banks were the those who both ignited the financial crisis, they were also doing bad in the financial crisis. In, in Europe, if you want to scale your business, a lot of people, they would go to the bank and create more debts instead of going to the capital market and get not only capital on board, but also new competences. Because when you want to start scaling your business, you also need new competences. Uh, and this is why we have been pushing to develop also the European capital market so that also smaller businesses have access to capital in a different way. Because the paradox is that you see a lot of talent. You see a very, very vibrant European ecosystem when it comes to creating new companies, when it comes to innovative uh, ideas in, in this market. Um, you may go to Paris for uh, the Ivory T Eiffel Tower or something like that. You really should go there for their ecosystem uh, in tech. Same thing in Berlin. You see there is this complete change uh, in how this uh, works. But without a digital single market, without access to capital, well, no wonder that you don't see the same kind of growth. And then you see, as you said initially, all the acquisitions. A number of these European businesses have been acquired by, uh, by US companies. And the regulation you were talking about earlier, that hasn't discouraged companies from starting up in Europe? I don't think so, um, mostly because most of it is quite new. <laughs> So that would be uh, difficult to test. No, I think you see a lot of uh, activity in the startup scene, a uh, lot of dynamism there. What you don't see is the growth. You sort of miss the scale up uh, part of it. Uh, and I think the lack of a digital single market is a very big reason for that, because then you don't think um, sufficiently large scale when you are in the startup phase, because you see the national bar barriers, you see regulatory barriers, uh, between uh, countries uh, within Europe. And how would you respond to the you know, argument that you're just engaged in digital protectionism against these American companies so that you can grow companies in your own economy? Well, the thing is that, you know, uh, living up to our rules on competition doesn't change the two factors I just mentioned. Uh, building a digital single market and having access to capital. And these are businesses that are thriving in the European market. Uh, if you ask anyone, they wouldn't say, well, yes, I use Google because it's a US company. They'd say, I use Google because it works. It's, these are great products. They work very well for me. Uh, so I think we don't initially think about companies as being US companies because it feels completely natural, embedded in, in European reality. So a lot of the issues we've been talking about on digital so far are you know, consumer choices, prices, and the like. I think some of the biggest issues that exercise everyone's attention are you know, th not the sort of consumers we necessarily want to care about very much, people that want to share tips about how to carry out a terrorist attack mm. or recruit followers to a terrible cause or to spread fake news or to bully people online. You know, you were talking about you have a hammer. You know, are those things nails or are those something else? I think to a very large degree they are something else. Uh, and this is why colleagues of mine with different tools uh, have been, uh, been working uh, to do something about it because it is a paradox that we have discussed and discussed and discussed 
and agreed and put into legislation in the real world rules on uh, child pornography, the ban of that, uh, that you cannot excite to, to violence and terrorism. All of that, it completely, we take it completely as a neutral thing. You would be taken down in less than 30 seconds if you started handing out bum recipes or child pornography uh, outside this building. No questions asked, of course you would. And we haven't had the same standard in digital services. And the big question is why? Why have we accepted for so long that things we have not just agreed on, but discussed and discussed and discussed and found balancing when it comes to free speech and non-censorship in the real world, that we haven't applied the same principles when it comes to the digital world. That I find mind-boggling. And we are getting there, but we're getting there slowly. And do you worry that if we had more competition, the whole point of competition is more innovation, more quality, more quantity, and that could actually lead to more of some of the things we don't like about the online and digital world? That you know, you'd have new competitors emerge that are the better website for recruiting terrorists or sharing child pornography, and it's easier to re control and regulate that if there's just one company, um, one monopolist, not eight competitors. Well, I think in any, you can have this sort of very uh, dark perspective. You can also have the better <laughs> perspective <laughs> of the services that we enjoy. Uh, there is a tendency of, of big companies being created. There is a competition for the market because when you are then in the market, you grow. You grow scale. You may have a huge fixed cost. But your marginal costs there will be approaching zero quite fast uh, when you uh, get more users on board. And I think you have a point, of course, that we have bigger problems and issues when it comes to the spreads of bad ideas. But that is mirrored in the possible uh, uh, positive sides of that. I just think we have to develop and keep pace so that we can enable uh, sort of also uh, the police to work in the digital world, especially when the two things merge, so that to a still sort of um, lower degree we'll think about a digital space and a physical space, because the two things will interact with one another, uh, as we do right now, because a lot of this is, well, seen by other people, they will comment, uh, so it will have a second life. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd love to take a few moments on some non-digital mm -hmm. questions now. I, I didn't have any prepared on the nail guns, so I <laughs> apologize um, for that. Um, but one of the ones that did make probably more news than that was the siemens Alstom mm -hmm. merger, um, which you blocked. It got a lot of criticism from the political authorities in Germany and France. And just wanted to ask you, one of the arguments is, you know, China doesn't have antitrust enforcers like you. Maybe you don't want to comment on them either, but they're not like you. And they're playing by a very different set of rules. You know, if you in the United States are playing by this traditional set of rules, China's playing by a completely different set. Do you need to take that into account as we prepare for competition with them? Are you being sort of a sucker in, in you know, just playing by your rules without paying attention to what they're doing? No, well, we pay attention in, in both directly, because one of the things, of course, we do when, when businesses want to merge, well, we're looking, is there someone else that the consumer can turn to? If the merging businesses, they have higher prices, they limit choice, quality is falling, is there someone else that I could turn to? Uh, and here, of course, the Chinese companies, they play a role. Are they relevant? Would they be suppliers if, uh, for instance, trains would be so much more expensive? Uh, so we take that into consideration, uh, and here we find, and, and this has now, a, I think, a 10-year perspective, um, that the probability of an entrant in very high-speed trains is not likely. Uh, same in mainline signaling. It may be so in, in metro systems, but here you'd find a number of competitors, because in large part of this uh, train merger, we had no issues only in mainline signaling and very high-speed trains. So we take sort of market participants from around the globe into consideration to see, well, could they come here? Uh, and these, of course, are very important markets because we are transforming uh, sort of the European rail space 
to make sure that we have a signaling standard that allows trains to row to, to, to come from one country to another with no hassle. Uh, and of course, a very high speed train is a very good alternative uh, to going by plane. So very important market for the future. Um, the debates about uh, the prohibition of the merger ignited, I think, a very important debate about how we are in the global market. Uh, a very important debate, uh, because uh, in China they do have antitrust, uh, they may have a different perspective. One of the things they don't seem to have is the prohibition of uh, state aid. So you have gigantic uh, state-owned companies where the financing structure is quite opaque, uh, to, say, to say it mildly. So we basically took the starting point to say, if we ask fair competition of businesses in Europe, well, we would also stand up for them when they are met with unfair competition in the global market. So a somewhat more hard-nosed approach when uh, European businesses are met with unfair competition. That could be in public procurement in Europe. Uh, to be much more specific in what you expect of uh, companies taking part in the bidding process. Second, saying, if you want to be part of the bidding process in Europe, we expect European companies also to be able to take part in, bis in bidding processes in your uh, country. To use our trade defense mechanisms in a more uh, quick uh, way to make sure that if things are dumped upon us, that you can stop it. So a much more sort of specific, hands-on strategy to use the tools we have to say, well, when we ask for fair competition, we also want to promote it globally. And we are willing to take the steps to make this happen. So another jurisdiction that doesn't have rules on state aid is the one you're in right mm -hmm. now, the United States. Um, in Europe, could you have anything like the spectacle we saw with all the states and cities bidding for Amazon's headqu second headquarters? Not without a phone call from, uh, from one of my staffers. Could the European Union as a whole do something like that? Like with Airbus? As a whole, well, the Airbus history is very interesting because we discussed that when we discussed uh, about uh, trains. Uh, the thing is, when, when you, if you want to buy a train, actually a number of competitors would be able to offer you different uh, uh, functionalities, um, all kinds of different things. Uh, back in the days, 20, 25 years ago, there was a very little competition when it comes to uh, bigger planes. Uh, in Europe, you could only find producers of smaller planes or parts uh, that would go into bigger planes. So Airbus was constructed actually to enable competition with uh, US businesses. Um, I think it has worked quite well because you have, I think, quite intense competition between Boeing and, uh, and Airbus. Uh, that allows us to have a more efficient uh, industry also when it comes to, to planes. So you can have sort of pro-competitive mergers just as well as you can have anti-competitive mergers. And you know, coming back to the United States, are states and municipalities competing? Or do you view that as unfair competition, inspired public policy, or you're just sort of laughing as we waste all of our own money? <laughs> No. And is there something we can do about it? Well, do you have I any advice for us? I think at, at least we very much recognize that we live in, in, a, in a gray zone. Uh, because on the one hand side, we say, well, you cannot hand out a tax benefit to a specific company. Uh, that's a, a selective advantage that's not available for the rest. At the same time, between member states, uh, our treaty allow for a tax competition. So you can have, I think now, 9% uh, corporate taxation in Hungary, 29% uh, in other countries. So between countries you can have tax competition, but not for specific companies. And, and that's, of course, is, that's a dilemma uh, that our sort of founding fathers, those who have been working with the treaties over, over the decades, they have said, well, in respect of tax autonomy of the individual member states, we would want uh, member states to be able to set their own level of taxation, but because we don't also want competition, you cannot have that uh, individual companies or group of companies that they can have uh, advantages not available for anyone else. And I think it's important to say, well, these are dilemmas that we will live with, but also that we will keep discussing. Uh, because when it comes to taxation, 
I think it is very important that we keep pushing because if, for instance, our corporate taxation system doesn't understand how value is created in a digital economy, well, then very soon state coffers, they will lose out because a lot of value are being created in ways that was not created before. A thing like taxable presence. Well, how to understand taxable presence if you have a headquarter somewhere, but you have a very, very good business in another place. Back in the days when corporate taxation was invented, of course you had a taxable presence because things were physical. So there's a, a European, but also global need to update our line of thinking. Uh, because otherwise, uh, we will end up in a very unbalanced situation where you leave it to the individual citizen to pay taxes and where companies to a very, very large degree will escape that. Uh, and this is why we are pushing uh, in Europe, but also within the OECD, to have a common approach to make sure that this will happen. Also because, yes, it may be, you know, not the first thing you think about in the morning, the happiness of paying taxes, but if you have to do it, the annoyance that you have a number of different system, uh, systems uh, is quite an annoyance. I thought in Denmark people actually did wake up feeling happy about paying taxes. Is that not, that's not well, right? Well, only after the first cup of coffee. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, the um, U.S. Treasury weighed in when you, did, um, when you brought the case against Apple and Ireland as two consenting adults that agreed that Apple wouldn't pay taxes to Ireland and the Treasury weighed in saying competition authorities shouldn't be involved and didn't understand these tax issues. I should say this document was never shared with the Council of Economic Advisors before it was released. Um, so this is the opposite of an advertisement for myself. Um, <laughs> but uh, how much can competition authorities play a role in fixing these problems versus you really need you know, the finance ministries, the tax authorities? But we can only be subcontractors here. Uh, of course, you really need uh, legislation to change. Um, what we have seen over the last five years is that I think 14 different pieces of, of legislation has been passed. It takes unanimity, uh, so it's quite challenging to do that. But loopholes have been closed. Uh, the OECD work uh, on uh, anti-tax avoidance, sort of to avoid the base to be eroded and, and profits to be shifted, is now fully uh, passed and in the process of being implemented but also individual member states uh, are changing their tax legislation. Uh, the Dutch are in the process, process of a full overhaul of uh, their tax system. Uh, Luxembourg have changed uh, their tax system uh, quite a lot in order, for instance, for the fiat case not to repeat itself. Uh, Ireland are changing their taxation system, what they call the double Irish, uh, which is sort of a company where one part of the company is not uh, to, be, to be taxed uh, in Ireland is being grandfathered and it will end, uh, I think, uh, basically this year. So the individual cases, the change in national tax legislation and the broad picture sort of change of European tax legislation will allow us to at least take, I think, positive steps towards a situation where you have a much larger degree of tax fairness. Great. Um, so I now want to bring everyone into the, con or maybe not everyone, but everyone who wants to join the conversation in. There are four microphones, two down here, um, two up there. And consistent with our normal rules for the forum, this is a chance to ask a question, which is singular, ends in a question mark. And I will cut you off if you violate that rule. So why don't you set a great example with your question. Also identify yourself and, and where you're coming sure. from. Uh, hey, my name is Jan. Uh, I'm a student here at the college concentrating in computer science. And uh, I grew up in Germany and so I was very interested in the vision of the digital single market that you are laying out. And one thing that concerned me uh, was that uh, one, one thing you're arguing for was... Wait, um, this is going to be a question, right? Yes, it will okay. be. Um, was replicating the later stage funding um, structures that, that we see here in the US, for instance, uh, so the companies cannot just start up, but also then grow in these later stages. And 
I'm convinced that a, uh, like many of the problems we're wrestling here in the US with in terms of, of uh, the digital economy are caused by these kinds of venture capitalist business models that require you to grow at a breakneck pace to monetize uh, the last little bit out of your user. And um, my question is, how are you going to avoid just creating a slightly less invasive surveillance economy in the EU uh, by just replicating these kinds of business models that have proven so problematic? Well, that's, I think that's a very good illustration of the, of the dilemmas that we are facing, how to, how to balance things out. Because on the one hand side, we need a more dynamic capital market. Uh, we need investors to come in so that if you're a startup entrepreneur, you don't just create a lot of debts for yourself, but that you get capital on board and that you get new competences on board. People who can help you do the things that may not be your prime expertise yourself, being a, an entrepreneur, uh, maybe a, an engineer uh, with, with uh, the skills actually to do the services uh, themselves. Uh, what we are trying to do, uh, not uh, with me as, as, uh, as the chef de file, but colleagues, is to also discuss sustainable finance. How to make sure that you get finance also from other sources than just sort of the very traditional, uh, somewhat aggressive uh, venture capitalists, but that you also work with uh, crowd uh, crowdfinancing, sort of more slow money uh, that would like to come in. But part of that is also sort of just the practicalities of smaller businesses being able to go onto the stock exchange. Maybe do that group, to do that together. <coughs> uh, they may need not that much money, but if they come together, they can make a much bigger launch. So trying to attract different kind of money uh, into these businesses uh, and not just focusing on just one way of doing it. Uh, so for us, it's a, it's a full concept uh, that colleagues work on, sustainable finance, exactly for the reasons that you gave. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, my name is Anna, and uh, I recently um, completed a Blue Book traineeship uh, with the Commission uh, at the representation in Helsinki. And um, during this traineeship, I was doing a fair share of um, media monitoring. And I can say that um, you especially appear as something of a superstar on media. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's, you know, on the commission scale, which is not very high, of course, like if you look at the <laughs> mainstream media. But anyway, um, the, the, the pro profile of the commission and of, of you currently is quite high. And I, can, I, I think that these, um, these fines put on these big companies are actually pretty popular among citizens. So is the commission now actually trying to capitalize on this, this um, popular view that the citizens are having on this, especially considering that the, the elections are coming up. Oh, I look forward to how you're gonna answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so do I. <laughs> but I think it would be nice to be able to do that. Uh, I'm not sure that we are able to do that sort of full scale. Um, I think maybe the fact that, as you say, it, it gets uh, also positive attention uh, that we are enforcing on behalf of 500 million people, that we are on the side of, uh, of the customer to be, you know, probably served, um, that it can be part of balancing, but I will be doubtful to say that it can fully sort of overcome part of the skepticism uh, that the European democracy is also a big bureaucracy. Um, because sometimes, you know, the challenge is that you don't see sort of your national uh, bureaucracy, you just see the European bureaucracy. And you don't therefore see the benefits of having one set of rules instead of 28 set of rules. Because that is something that the exporting businesses, they see that. Uh, when you get, uh, for instance, one set of rules on privacy, and protecting of data, the ease of that compared to having 28 different sets of rules on privacy that you will have to, to deal with. So 
I think we still have a lot to do to say, well, it makes sense that we do things together that we really do together. Uh, and this is, of course, why I think top of mind right now would be uh, climate change, uh, cybersecurity, uh, managing uh, immigration, um, creating uh, jobs in a still more digitalized economy, sort of things that are really European scale. And here, hopefully, what we are doing <coughs> when it comes to also competition law enforcement could be sort of a bridgehead into that discussion. Great. Yeah. Good evening, Commissioner, Professor. My name is Seth Johnston. I'm a visiting scholar at the Center for European Studies here at Harvard. I'm holding a copy of, of this week's Economist newspaper, uh, the leading story of which many of you have seen uh, is similar to the story that we're discussing here today. And in these pages, uh, the Economist says of the business community that the business community considers Europe to be, quote, an entrepreneurial wasteland and the spiritual home of bureaucracy, unquote. Now, that's obviously very colorful language uh, and probably exaggerates the point, but uh, what would you say to, to those critics who might say um, that the approach we're discussing here on additional regulation and so forth uh, effectively doubles down on approaches to these problems that many in the business community see as a shortcoming of the European economic environment and approach to these issues? But I'm still looking forward to figure out who of those faceless people on the front page that I would be. Um, I think it very much depends on what you expect a society to be. Uh, because I, we, we are now in the process of finalizing a paper on ethical guidelines for uh, artificial intelligence. That it should be human-centered, that it should allow for human oversight, um, you know, number of things that would make sure that you have technology that serve humans. Uh, I don't think that you'd find such a paper in China. It's, it, it's a guess, but I wouldn't think of it as likely. But the thing is that I think we should leave it to the Chinese to be Chinese. Europeans would be lousy Chinese. It's, it's not our DNA. This is not the way we built Europe. It's not the way we want Europe to be. And I think it's very important to say, well, this is because we want a different way of our society to develop. This is because we, we want citizens to feel at home. It's because we want to limit inequality. We want businesses to be challenged to do privacy by design when they, when they offer new services. Uh, we want them to think about developing AI that is actually um, uh, will live up to uh, competition rule and not just eventually in the future make their own uh, AI cartels uh, and collude with one another in a black box sort of line of thinking. Because this is about what society do we want to live in and what business community would we like to develop and support. Uh, because the business community is not uh, uh, inhabited by aliens. It, it, it's my brother, it is uh, your sister, it is someone's father. Uh, these are citizens just as well as the rest of us. And of course, there is a discussion about what is sort of the corporate responsibility, how to be a good corporate citizen. And that, I think, is one of the major discussions, because otherwise, how will you recruit in the future? We spend the best part of our uh, uh, hours uh, of the day uh, working, so why wouldn't you expect those working hours also to represent something that you like and prefer, and not just what you do after hours when you're off? Great. Yeah. Hi, Commissioner. Thank you very much for coming to speak to us tonight. Um, my name is Emmanuel. I'm a sophomore here at the college. And given that you've already spoken about the benefits that the European single market might bring, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about other areas of European integration. From the standpoint that you currently have as commissioner for competition, but also from the standpoint of someone who is leading, helping to lead a major parliamentary family into the European elections and someone who is often mentioned as a potential future president of the European Commission. Um, do you see any other areas that would potentially be beneficial for better, greater European cooperation and integration or perhaps places where that integration has gone too far? Well, this is 
this is the debate right now, uh, because uh, the, the debate about who is who in Brussels is, I think, a secondary debate. The most important debate is where do we want to go? Um, when, when we want to live up to our, our promises when it comes to climate change, this is not something that we will choose. This we will treat as a given to deal with climate change, to figure out how do we transition uh, the European economies uh, into, into a, economies that will live up uh, to our obligations when it comes to climate change. When it comes to feeling safe, uh, cyber security, hybrid uh, warfare, uh, to deal with sort of the most obvious issues uh, that make us feel not comfortable in our everyday life. But, but also to make sure that working with member states that we can ask the most obvious question, um, will my child have a job? Uh, because in a number of member states, I think people still think that, well, yes, I am a, as a parent, it's okay. But I, I don't think, I'm not sure that my children will have the same chances. And that push is, of course, what we need. But this is not necessarily done uh, in our European democracy. This is done in the interaction between the national democracies and our European democracy. And those debates, those are the real engaging debates, constructively engaging debates. But just as well, we have sort of the negative debates because we have questions about uh, rule of law, uh, press freedom, um, fake news, uh, things that, in my opinion, uh, you have to be very strong about that uh, because this was what we built uh, our European Union on. And uh, the rule of law is not something abstract, uh, remote, just for, for speeches. Uh, it is you having the same chance of being accepted uh, to a university as the one who knows uh, the rector's uh, or the, the dean's daughter. Yes, I, <laughs> I, 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 know, I know both of them. Um, <laughs> you're Hi, I'm Naomi. I'm a sophomore at the college. So in addition to fines, does the commission take any preventative actions to promote competition? And if not, do you think this would be an important addition to the mandate of the commission, given the changing landscape of the digital community? Well, I, I do hope that the work we do uh, has an element of deterrence. Uh, that you know that if eventually you will be caught doing something illegal, you will not do something illegal. Um, and also, I think, uh, because that is my, my impression, the huge majority of businesses, they are absolutely on the right side of, uh, of the law, uh, which is, of course, a great encouragement uh, to try to find those who are not on the right side of the law, to make sure that all of those who are law-abiding, that not only do they get the benefit from that, they don't, they are not harmed, by those who are not on the wrong side of the law. Uh, I think that is very important, the deterrence uh, side of things. And both uh, the fines serves that, but also the fact that if you do not live up to sort of what you get obliged to do in a decision, there is a risk that you get also a daily penalty till you get back on the right side of things. Um, we can do a, uh, a settlement uh, if things are not uh, uh, too harmful, then we can do a settlement and do binding, commi uh, binding commitments, as we did in, uh, in the Amazon case that we had on e-books. An example, of actually, a quite a fast case. It was only two years. Amazon had very, very, very far-reaching uh, what we call most favored nation clauses. If, uh, if you were to give something to a com competitor to, uh, to Amazon, Amazon claimed that you had to give them the same benefit. And that, obviously, was a big problem to competition. Here, we took binding commitments to allow for competition to happen. And now we see change in the e-books market. You see more um, competitors to Facebook actually gaining a, a foothold uh, in that market as well. And that ought to promote competition. Um, so you're waiting patiently. So you can be the very last question. Thank you. Alan White from uh, Telus Institute. Um, my question concerns the uh, the, the purview of the commission. Uh, certainly in the U.S., as in Europe, the Constitution, the, the basic foundational documents dating back to the Constitution, the Magna Carta in the U.K., 
Germany, the rest of the uh, EU. Uh, the law is uh, meant to address the concentration of power in all its forms. So the message basically is distribute, decentralize, limit, check, and balance in so many words. And that's pretty much cuts across the union as it does the US. You can have companies that are large and may not adversely affect consumer pricing, but may affect because of their bigness, their sheer size, and the concentration of economic power introduces problems of regulatory capture, inappropriate behavior in terms of labor relations, issues around the environment, and so on and so forth, just because of the bigness, even though on the consumer pricing and efficiency side, the traditional standards for anti-competitive behavior uh, may not be uh, a, a problem. Is your commission, can it, by law, introduce bigness in its own right as a reason for denying or breaking up or otherwise controlling monopoly? Well, I think at least that is what people uh, tell me when I ask, uh, could we, as a last resort, break up a company? Let's say, yes, we do have the legislative basis to do that but it's never been done. Uh, we don't consider size to be a problem in itself. We consider lack of competition being a problem. And um, we have, for instance, if you take merger control, we have allowed uh, for enormous companies to be created in, in beers, in cement, in dairy products, in a number of industries because we found that these giant businesses would still be faced with competition. You could go to someone else uh, for a beer, you could go for someone else for cement, you could go to someone else for your dairy products. So it wasn't the size in itself that was the problem. It was whether there was were competition in the European market or not. Um, one of the reasons why it's so interesting with uh, the Furham uh, report, uh, hopefully the report of my three special advisors, what they're thinking about in, in Australia, is when we see this sort of competition for the market. Who is to be the dominant player in this market? That this is the competition that we see. And then how, what should we think about the obligations of the big guy in this market? Uh, that is sort of the kind of question that we are pushing right now. Because in some, to, to some degree, you, you become the regulator in this market. You set the rules of the game. Uh, and we try to understand that more in depth. This is why we have this probe into the Amazon use of data, because Amazon is both a host of a number of many, many, many small businesses, which is a great service, because then you can have a digital side to your business next to your brick and mortar uh, side of your business. But does that then mean that when Amazon have access to all this data, about what you're looking for, how you pay, what you're looking for next, your frequency of coming back, since Amazon is also themselves a competitor to all of those small, small businesses. How do then they, they then use that kind of data? Uh, in that, they kind of regulate the business of the smaller guys, and these are the things that we take an interest in, in order exactly to see, well, how does bigness, when you have won the competition for the market, then allow for competition in the market. I think that is a perfect note to end on, so join me in thanking Commissioner Vestager. Thank you.